All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for waiting. I think we'll figure out AGI before we figure out AV, but that's just one of my predictions. Uh, I want to talk to you today about natural language processing and the future of AI. And sometimes it's helpful to look a little bit into the past uh, to see what lessons we can learn to predict the future a little bit better. And one of those uh, times was actually exactly about half a decade ago, uh, in June 2018, when my collaborators, collaborators Brian McCann, Nitish, Tsai Ming, and I published this paper on the natural language processing decathlon. And that paper essentially introduced the idea of prompt engineering and the idea that maybe we can have not just pre-trained word vectors, not just pre-trained encoders, but also pre-trained entire models, including a decoder. And we were super excited at the time. Uh, basically here, one of the central ideas of the, uh, of the paper was that we cast all tasks essentially as a question answering problem over some kind of context. And we basically thought about the hardest NLP tasks out there, things like question answering over a standard context, what is sort of the official academic in the past way of looking at question answering, but also asking questions like, what is the translation from English to German of this particular context, a sentence? Or what is the summary of this paragraph? Or are these entailed? Or is this sentence positive or negative? Sentiment analysis and all these different tasks. And it took us actually almost half a year, and especially Brian McCann, the first author, to just phrase all of these problems and pre-process the data in a way that will actually work in a single model. And this was the single model. You'll, if you're familiar with transformer architectures that had come out just a year prior, you'll see a lot of similar ideas of these models, tons of co-attention. Uh, we made one big mistake, which is we still had uh, a recurrent neural network at the very beginning, but then had a lot of self-attention, co-attention mechanisms between a question and the context. And we were super excited because after another six months of tuning, and uh, we wish we had weights and biases already then, um, so it would be a lot easier to do now, uh, but after a lot of tuning of all these different models, uh, or sorry, of the single model across all these different tasks, we basically got it to work. And in some cases, it worked better than anything else, but we also learned that, wow, translation, for instance, made everything harder. Like trying to squeeze translation as a task into the single model that is everything else mostly in English, which is where, unfortunately, most of the NLP data sets have been, was very, very challenging. But overall, it worked. So we're super excited. We submit this paper. And we get back the reviews, and well, it was not a great day. Um, it was, at the time, very sad, because basically the reviewers wrote things like, this makes me doubt if this multitask learning is useful. If our goal is to optimize the performance of a single task, this general model sacrifices this important prior knowledge of an individual task which was true. We wanted to build a single model for all of NLP and not say, oh, well, in this particular task, we can use the fact that it's like a continuous span answer or something like that. Another reviewer wrote, I think the framing of DECA NLP does more harm than good. It perpetuates this misguided view of question answering, namely that it is a unified phenomenon, that it could be a unified phenomenon. There's no such thing as general question answering, not even for humans, to which I always asked. There is one brain. We're using mostly that one brain to answer all the different questions. But that was not the state the field was in. And it, it's kind of hilarious to read all of these and hearing and seeing like all of these questions require very different systems to answer. And trying to pretend that they are the same doesn't help anyone solve any problems. And so obviously, with ChatGPT, prompt engineering, large language models, we know that this has been fairly wrong. But overall, after getting all these reviews in, the area chair was absolutely certain to reject this paper. And why do I bring this up? It's like sometimes when you're trying to work and predict the future, the best way is to actually make it happen yourself. That way, you know someone is going to work on this prediction that you think will happen. And you have to stick to your guns even if it's not obvious. And unfortunately, I wish it was as easy to say, do something that is controversial. But you can also be controversial and wrong. You need to be controversial and right. But it is something that I feel felt was very important to not just do what everyone else is doing, which is right now, like, fine-tune LM. 
that's still super interesting, and there are lots of things we can do to make it even faster and use less RAM and whatnot, but I think there are a couple of ideas in the space that are much less explored, and I'll mention some of those at the end. Now, I had a bit of a deja vu moment to this uh, when we launched in the summer of 2020 U.com, or we you know, founded the company, and I had a lot of VCs, uh, not reviewers, but VCs tell me, why would you work on search? That is such a misguided idea. Um, no one will ever beat Google. They have all the AI. They have all the people. They have all the data, um, all the distribution channels. There is nothing you can do. And you know, then we said you know, internally, well, clearly NLP has gotten so much better. Yet the biggest application of NLP, which is search, hasn't really changed that much. When you look today and you ask some you know, Python, Fibonacci diagram computation-like query, you ask Google, this is your answer. And this has basically been your answer for the last 15 years, despite seeing how NLP has gotten better and better over these last 15 years. And you can scroll down, and maybe you'll see people also ask or others want to know now. And you know, this is a, in some ways, it's a little bit of an inkling here of having a chat, right? You just can't yourself chat, you just have to choose some predefined chats. But sadly, none of those will either give you the answer. And so we thought, clearly, you could do better. And this is what we came up with. Uh, basically, you have this chat interface that will just give you the right answer, and we'll have a little copy and paste button right there so you can be done with it. And if you still really want to see links, you have them on the right. You can minimize those two and make them disappear. Right here, you'll have different answers. And what one thing we thought was very important is you also have citations and you have references and apps within this chat window. As much as I love text and have worked on natural language processing for over a decade, text isn't always the right way to answer a question. Sometimes you want to see an image. No one is ever going to shop for dresses or even an air purifier by just text. You usually want to see what it looks like. And you want to also have references and verify if the information is correct, which we basically do with both citations on the web as well as uh, these apps. And so we actually did a study where we compared and you know, asked for an independent uh, organization called Surge uh, to do the study and see if you can actually be more efficient as a developer using u.com versus Google. And the answer is, indeed, 72% of the cases, u.com was better or the same as Google. And not only that, but on average, you save half of, your all, half of your time when you're trying to find answers and debugging questions and code snippets and ways to do things. And so we're very excited uh, to actually be able to make the lives of developers more efficient with the search engine and have now data to back up that, that it was indeed possible, even though 2020, people thought there's zero chance to do anything better than Google. Now, it's not just about coding questions. It's also about general NLP questions. And if you have worked in NLP, you'll see a couple of different tasks that were solved here that were actually quite surprising. So I can ask a question like, what does CRM stand for? And it talks about customer relationship management systems and whatnot. And I can ask, what's the biggest such company? Now you have you know, such company, some reference to a prior conversation. And then you ask, what's their stock price? And when we launched this in uh, the winter of, of 2022, last year, we basically immediately saw the problem of hallucinations. And you know, most standard large language models, if you ask what's the stock price of this company, will come up with some numbers that seem like the next reasonable prediction um, sequence of byte pair encodings. But they will not actually tell you the right stock price, which could be pretty problematic. Uh, and so instead, again, we lean on this open platform where everyone can contribute, and we have these multimodal apps. And so the LM can actually decide, instead of answering this question with text, I will answer it with this visualization and this GUI. And there you can click and say, OK, I want to see the week. And you see the actual ground truth. And the same is true for weather and a bunch of other issues. And then, again, magically, you can ask, who is the CEO? And it will kept, it'll have kept the reference, still know we're talking about Salesforce as a company, and then give you that answer. 
And if you, you know, think just 10 years back, there were entire PhD theses written about things like co-reference resolution, which is basically to understand their or its, who does it refer to, what does it refer to. All of this is now irrelevant thanks to LMs. It's pretty incredible. Now, there's more that you can do than just text. Again, you might ask, how can I generate an image with AI? And the answer is, yeah. Yes, that's possible, but also here, you can just do it right there in the search engine. So when you think about building an app, you can build an app on the iPhone, on the app, uh, on the web, on the open web, or inside you.com, and then you'll have baked in traffic when that app is relevant. In this case, you have UImagines, one of the apps we have to build to get the platform going, but it will just basically let you do what you set out to do when you ask that question. It's kind of thinking about the jobs to be done framework, which is, I think, a really great framework for finding good startup ideas. This one was one of my favorites, kind of the skydiving baby. I tried a couple of different ones, and ultimately I felt like this was the most reasonable one because, you know, let's face it, they can't pull the parachute themselves, so it's much safer to do a tandem jump. <laughs> um, I think, in general, you're going to see and think about a lot of different generative AI capabilities in the next couple of months and years if you're in this space. And one mental framework uh, I came up with a few weeks ago is essentially to think about when it would take a long time to create some kind of human work artifact, but it would be very quick to verify that it's correct or useful. And one example is a clear one is code. You can just ask the AI to write some code for you and then you can very quickly run it if it compiles, if it executes, and does it in a reasonable amount of time, you know that it's, it's good. Uh, likewise, with images, it's another really good example because it would take you forever to create that image, but you look at it in a few seconds and you know if it looks good or not. I think there are a lot of other artifacts that we can create with generative AI, and it's, I think uh, a framework that might be helpful for choosing what kind of startups or problems you want to work on in Gen AI. I think overall, chat and NLP and search are all merging into more and more a single model for all of it. And one might think, oh, still Google, it's impossible to beat, so hard, so big. But I would argue that chat is actually even bigger than just search itself. You can do much longer follow-up questions. You can ask for summaries of different websites, and ultimately, and maybe not too far into the future, you'll have it actually execute actions for you and basically become your personal assistant, maybe even your digital twin. Because ultimately, there are things like this that give you an example of something you would have never asked a traditional search engine, but you can ask a chat first search engine. And here the query is write me a website with JavaScript code and a commenting function. You know, you wouldn't ask that to Google because you know Google would just, again, give you back a list of blue links. So with that, I want to just do one more example of an LM that we were motivated by when GPT-3 came out um, a, two years or three years ago. Oh, almost longer than that, Nick. Four years ago now. I need to update my accounts. Uh, and basically, uh, one of our motivations was large sequence models are super powerful. But it's going to be hard to build an even larger model than OpenAI had at the time. And so we thought, where else could this technology be useful? And our answer was in another type of sequence, and if you will, another type of very natural human or biological language, and that is the language of proteins. And it turns out that over the last decade, we've had more and more protein sequence data, sequences of amino acids. And for the non-biology people here, proteins essentially govern everything in your body. They're like the source code of biology, everything in health, sickness, um, and diseases. They're all governed. You know, COVID is a protein. Everything is a protein um, in the side of your human body. And so basically, if you can understand that language and then actually generate proteins, you could, I think, ultimately change all of medicine. And I think this technology and you know, actually power combining it with wet lab experiments will enable us to eventually, in the next 10, at most 30 years, have as good of a grasp on viruses as we now have on bacteria. And that will change a lot of people's uh, health situation. What was interesting here is that we first published this paper, and as a lot of good papers also first got rejected uh, from a bunch of uh, science journals and whatnot. 
Um, but then we actually went ahead, we continued, we're kind of stubborn that way, and we actually generated and synthesized those proteins in real wet labs. And that is surprisingly hard. It took like 12 months to just say, here's this sequence, like make it happen, and then tell us how well it works. But it turned out that the AI had actually understood the structure of these proteins. And if you're familiar with transformers, they have these attention mechanisms and basically uh, it, like weighted attention on different past inputs. And the fascinating thing was that these models actually had implicitly recovered that folding structure and that they paid more attention to things that are closed in 3D space, even if they're far away in the sequence space. And ultimately, the synthesized proteins worked. They actually folded correctly. They had very antibacterial properties as a particular lysozyme protein that we generated. And now there are multiple different companies that have uh, started based on this idea. Uh, one is called Profluent from Ali Madani, the first author of this paper, too. So that, um, I want to encourage you all to try out you.com. And I guess we don't have time for questions. So thanks. I'll be around. <laughs> Bye.